Sebastian, welcome back to Talk Python to Me. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. It's yeah, a pleasure it's, to be here again. Oh, it's, it's great to have you back. When you were on the show, we were talking about Fast API, and it seemed like so much had happened. You've done so much, and now there's like all these other frameworks that you've built and all, all sorts of exciting things, right? Yeah, <laughs> very, very exciting stuff. It's like very exciting because Python is getting so excited. Well, it's very exciting. It has always been exciting, but there's so many new things that it's great to build things with them. It's interesting. I feel like your frameworks more than many take advantage of and almost depend upon the latest aspects of Python. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like uh, someone made a, a meme at some point on Twitter about like this guy that was like, a pen pineapple apple pen and it was like yeah. type annotations and, and another library and just put them together and that, that's what i'm building and yeah it's pretty accurate yeah absolutely you know there's as a community we sort of muddled our way through the python two to three transition and it took a lot longer than even guido and everyone many other people expected it to take but now that we're on the other side of it stuff like what you're creating and other people are creating, that's what would have been possible had we gone sooner, right? <laughs> but now it's like, no, everyone's putting their effort into this, these new ideas and these new aspects that are now possible. Yeah, uh, I think it's yeah. Great. yeah, absolutely. And, and um, I feel like the way Python is, is growing and improving is, uh, is amazing. Like, you know, the, there are some growing pains like as with any project or with anything. But like so, like it, it's been able to grow in the directions that are needed, and to support all the things that users are needing, and like we can do very cool stuff that will not even be possible in other languages. And it's I don't know for me, it's super exciting. Yeah, it same as for me as well. It just gets more exciting. Uh, I think you know you could see it. You just keep working the same thing, and it just keeps ah oh, well. I've been doing that for a long time. I need to change, but I don't feel that way at all. I feel like. Every day there's something new and amazing and and still the possibility for more incredible things to come is certainly out there, right? It's I don't feel like we've hit the limit of what it's possible for framework authors like you to build or for the core devs to make Python do. You know, there's the whole performance resurgence thing that Guido Van Rossum and Mark Shannon are doing, that Sam Gill did, that Anthony Shaw is doing uh, and, and others. Um, yeah, I think there's. Yeah. It's good, right? Yeah, it's amazing, and I feel like the how the the energy between the community and the core developers and like uh, editors and all the tooling, like all growing together and all supporting each other, like helps each other part to grow more and better, and it's so exciting. Yeah, you know, absolutely. To, to get like, for example, like the support for very recent things and have been able to use them right away in editors is like, oh, so cool. It is absolutely cool. And um, yeah, the editors are, are definitely coming along as well. Now, before we get into your latest project, SQL Model, which is very exciting, let's just get a quick update on you. You know, you told us the story how you got in programming Python before, so we're not going to ask you that again. But what have you been up to since you were on the show last? So when I was on the show last, uh, we were talking about FastAPI, right? Uh, yes. And Typer already existed, if I'm not wrong, right? Yeah, I think that, that those were the two things you had built. And okay, FastAPI okay, was, yeah. Uh, had FastAPI made it to the top three web frameworks yet? I'm not sure if it had, but it was it know. was right around um, that time. Yeah, I, I think incredible. it was very close to that to that point. That that was uh, mind blowing that uh, people were were being able to use it so much and adopt it so much, and like when it came out out in the service like that, it was super cool. Yeah, yeah. it was yeah, su super exciting. Uh, and yeah, like, I don't know, like I have been, uh, you know, like I have been trying to focus, like I have always try been trying to focus on whatever is the next thing that I can work on that will have the biggest impact that can help the most. Uh, and I end up just like changing uh, uh, areas and like trying to improve different areas and different things. And uh, recently that I was working with uh, SQL databases, uh, well, or recently, I don't know, some months ago, uh, that I was working with SQL databases and I was working some of the existing libraries and I wanted to have like all the benefits of the new features of Python. Uh, but I wasn't able to have like 
as, as much things as I could because most of these libraries were built before we had all these, all these new features. So I wanted to be able to get that. And I figured that uh, the best way to build it was applying the ideas that I had and the learnings that I had from the other tools and from the other things and just like put the thing together because there were some libraries that were trying to do similar things, but like, I feel like there was still a bit more that could be done. So yeah, I was just like trying to get that. Uh, and that, that's how it ended up starting. Yeah, fantastic. Now, I feel like SQL model, I, I don't know for sure I'm asking you, but if it seems to me looking in from the outside that SQL model was something you're like, I need a good ORM for fast API. And it the things out there didn't click for you in the way that you wanted. So you're like, I'm going to build something that that fits with this, right? Yeah, so it's like the good thing with FastAPI is that it doesn't have any uh, need for uh, tightly coupling it with any ORM, with any database, so mm -hmm. it can be used with anything. Uh, but still, there are some, some things that might not be as convenient in the ORM itself, like if you use it alone. And for example, with FastAPI that you use it to declare all the data models, all the shapes of the data that you want to receive and that you want to send back and to, to do like all the data validation, documentation, serialization. Then you declare a bunch of those data models with Pydantic. But at the same time, you will end up declaring, duplicating a lot of that information in a separate ORM uh, just to connect to the database and to hand, handle the database stuff with Python objects. But then you have to duplicate the information in two different ways. And that's what was like, it was not the best uh, developer experience, I guess. And I was trying to uh, make it a bit more user-friendly, a bit more developer-friendly, I guess would be the word, uh, to work with databases and data models and avoid all that duplication information. And at the same time, make it as easy as possible to write the code just using the same standard type annotations and just using the same, the same intuitive things that we can already use. Uh, yeah. And that's that's the point that I was trying to to hit. For people to see how that clicks together, I know twelve percent of the community who builds web APIs and frameworks is using Fast API. <laughs> but there's, you know, a, a decent percent out there who maybe haven't heard or looked into Fast API. Maybe they've heard about it, but they don't know the pieces. Maybe given that that's some of the motivation, maybe give us a, a sense of how how do you build data models that match your APIs and how do you do things like generate the, the open, the, the swagger documentation yeah. and, and stuff like that? Like set the stage for, for why just straight SQL alchemy or some other standard, uh, you know, um, pony ORM or something like that didn't just directly map over to how fast API works. Awesome. So like just a very quick uh, intro to FastAPI. It's a web framework that is focused a lot on building web APIs. And the main idea is that using the standard type annotations or type hints, so the way that you, in a function, you declare what is the type of some particular variable, using that same information, th that same information by default will give you some uh, certainty that the code is correct and will give you auto-completion and inline errors in the editor. FastAPI uses that same information to do data validation of the data that you receive in the web API and to do data serialization of the data that you are returning back uh, and to do automatic documentation. This is all based on a bunch of standards, open API, JSON schema, and a bunch of other things. And we, because it's based on these open standards, then it can generate and it can also provide a Swagger UI, as you were saying which is this web user interface that shows all the information of the API, all the endpoints, where are the data the shapes that you can send, and you can actually interact with the, you can interact with the API directly from the browser uh, without having to, you know, without having to go to some documentation site and then update and the wiki gets updated and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I built a, a weather service API for one of my courses. This has limited data. People don't try to use this for actual weather service. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it's a fast API API. And in addition to all the other cool things it does, like quickly generate the stuff it needs to, you can just go to slash docs and it'll give you the schemas. It'll give you uh, the API endpoints, 
the values that go in, the return value, all of this. Prime, I guess the most important aspect of this is probably Pydantic, correct? Yes, absolutely. Like the, so the most important part, you define your stuff in Pydantic models, and then that drives so many of these things. Yeah, so FastAPI is built on top of two tools. Pydantic does all the data stuff, data validation, serialization, documentation, and Starlet does all the web stuff. And FastAPI just puts them together in a way that they work together and adds some extra things on top. But Pydantic is the thing that powers all this data validation and all this automatic documentation. Uh, and right. Pydantic is, uh, is also based on the same type annotations, the standard Python type annotations. So you can just like use the same intuition that you will have for uh, standard Python and then get all this uh, data processing with Pydantic. Yeah. And FastAPI does several things with the Pydantic models. It does model binding, I, I guess I'll call it. It's, that term's not super common in the Python world, but you can just say my API function or web function takes a, this model and then fast API will like create the Pydantic model and set the values and do the validation. And then also the return value, you can say it will, will drive this documentation and so on. So the reason I wanted to set the stage so much around Pydantic is that's one of the core elements of SQL model, right? And, and not just using that library, but so that it can be used as the models in fast API, right? Yes, exactly. So SQL model is a library, what they usually call an ORM. And if you don't know what an ORM is, it's just a library to connect a SQL database with Python objects and classes. Uh, I don't know why we use the term ORM. I, think, <laughs> I feel it's a bit <laughs> abstract, but it's just a library to connect SQL databases with Python objects and classes. And the thing with SQL model is that it does a lot of work inside so that each model that you create is already a Pydantic model. It's not that it internally uses a Pydantic model or it internally creates some additional Pydantic model, it's that each model is itself a Pydantic model. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, so SQL models is built on top of Pydantic for, again, data processing, validation, all this stuff, and another library that does all the work to communicate with SQL databases, which is called SQL Alchemy. And each one of these models is both Pydantic and SQL Alchemy. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting marriage between Pydantic and SQL Alchemy. Much of the, the way that you work with it would be very familiar to people who do SQL Alchemy today, right? Yes, th that's the idea, that it will be very familiar for people that is already working with Pydantic, probably because they are using FastAPI, but at the same time, it will be very familiar for people working with SQL model because uh, it's just the same uh, the same look and feel. Uh, yeah, and it's indeed a strange marriage because these two libraries are so different that getting yeah. them to connect and work together in the, in the very different ways they are built, it, it was very, very strange. But it actually ended up like working quite well. Yeah, I, I imagine that it was pretty tricky. You know, anytime that you get in the middle of an ORM and its model, I've, I've tried to do that with other frameworks and said, oh, it would be great if I could say use inheritance in this way on my model so that there's not duplication. Like, oh, no, 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 you can't do that because the thing really depends upon the exact class that derives from its sort of like ORM base class, that's what it uses for its determining what columns are there and so on, right? Yeah, it, it, was, it was so crazy. I spent so much time in the debugger trying to figure out what was happening underneath and studying so much about like the black magic in Python, the stuff that I always feared, like all the meta classes and stuff and all that weird stuff. Yeah. I studied so much of that to be able to mix these things together. But uh, but yeah, like because they do things in a very different way. At the same time, that facilitated uh, uh, allowing one thing to do its job and the other thing to do its own job in their own particular ways. So yeah, it was uh, yeah. it was fun. Yeah, very cool. Whenever I think about an ORM, the thing that I first go to focus on is the python classes because for me the whole point of the orm is to let me talk to my database through those classes and model my application through those classes right so let's maybe get started by talking about uh, how do i create a class 
a, a model, a SQL model model <laughs> <laughs> here that is both a Pydantic model and a SQL Alchemy like model. Want to talk us through what does it look like? Cool. So uh, from SQL model, you will import this class SQL model. And SQL model, uh, uh, you inherit from this class. Uh, you can, for example, create a class hero. And then uh, let's, let's jump to the, the internal parts of that. Then you will define some attributes for this class hero. For example, you could say that it has an ID, that it will, and that this ID will be an integer. The way you declare that is with standard Python type annotations. You could say that it has a name and it's a string. Or If, if you are familiar with Pydantic, it basically could exactly be a Pydantic model. The yeah, way you declare yeah. Your in this simple case, right? In the yeah, yeah, exactly. In the, in if, the in it the really is just an integer, and it just has a number. You don't have to make it auto increment or any weird stuff like that, right? Exactly. In the in the simplest cases, it will be it will look just exactly like a Pydantic model, uh, and uh, in fact, it will be a Pydantic model. And then uh, for some particular cases where you need to add a little bit of extra information to tell SQL, uh, SQL model and SQL alchemy underneath to tell it, hey, this does this thing with the database, then you can pass additional parameters uh, and additional configurations. So for example, when you create the ID of this class, this will be the ID of the table and it has to be a primary key. So then you can use the function field to say, hey, this still has a default value of none but I need this particular field or this particular attribute or this particular column, however you want to call it. I need this to be the primary key. And then that information is passed through to SQL Alchemy underneath, which is the, the one that does all the work. And there's something particularly interesting here is that you are saying, hey, this has a default value of none. And that none the default value will be used by Pydantic in the Pydantic side of things, but at the same time, it will be used in the SQL side of things. So in the database, this, uh, this will have also uh, the particular default value. In the, in the case of the primary key, it's just because when you create a model, you still don't know what the primary right. key is. I, most it. of the time, the, de the database generates that. You could say exactly. your primary key could be your email address. But it's, it's common to have the auto, it's just auto generated by the database, a, a yeah. UUID or a, a auto incrementing integer or something like that. Exactly. So yeah. for, those, for those cases, you want to have the type annotations uh, uh, very precise uh, so that your code can tell you, hey, this could be known at some point. That's just a particular detail. But the thing is, the important thing is that you use standard type annotations to declare attributes. And then uh, this will be mapped to the data model in Pydantic, but at the same time will be mapped to the table in the SQL uh, database. Nice. So it kind of behaves in, in the two ways. And that means that what you put into your database is, is pretty much what your API model is as well, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the idea, uh, like in the most uh, basic situation. The, the cool thing is that uh, with this approach and with this, with this uh, tool, you can then create additional models that, that don't uh, map to one particular table in the database, but are just for, uh, for handling data in the API. For example, if you, create, if you have an API that receives data to create a user, it will probably receive a, pass, a password from the user. It will have the username and the password. And you want to be able to have that information in the model that you want to receive in the API, but you don't want to save the password as plain text in the database. <laughs> you don't? Isn't that the easiest way? <laughs> I, I get these warnings from these various sites like, oh, your password can't be more than eight characters long because, no, yeah, please don't save it in the database. That's a really interesting scenario, right? You, you need to receive it on one end, but you must not put it into the database. Exactly. You must so, it not carry on. And for example, in, and then in that same situation, you create a user and you want to return the information of the user back to whatever is the client. You don't want to return the plain text password. You want to say, hey, this is the username, but like, yeah. that's it. Yeah, probably not. It's very unlikely that you want to return the hash as well. You just, you don't want it to return at all, right? Yeah, so how, do you, exactly. how do you handle that? So for this, for these particular cases is where SQL model will shine because you can create one base model that will have like all the base attributes. For example, it could have the name, the last name, the address, 
the email, blah, blah, blah. And then you can inherit from that model and then have different models for the particular use cases. For example, for creating data, so you will have a plain text password. And for uh, returning data, you will have no password at all. But then one of these models will be the actual model that stays in the database, the one that reflects the information in the database. And this one is the one that will have the hashed password. But you didn't have to duplicate all the information for the model because they all inherit from the same base uh, model. Is that the section that I got on the screen here that says multiple models with fast API, like how yes. you do that? Okay. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So the idea is obviously you have got some shared information about the user, like the email and their name and stuff. You want to share that, probably their ID, but you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to share, say their, uh, like you said, the password or whether or not they're an admin on the site or those kinds of things you probably don't want to exchange over the API, right? Exactly. And, and if you need to duplicate all the information for each one of these particular models, there's a high chance that at some point, whenever you're refactoring the code, some part will be uh, out of sync. And then you will have a bunch of errors and a bunch of bugs that are very difficult to detect. When you have duplication of code and you have to synchronize it by hand, uh, it makes it creates a lot of potential bugs that are very difficult to detect. Yeah. So in the way you do your models, this is pretty neat. One of the things that you do is you've got your model, model hierarchy. You've got SQL model, which is the base class of all the things that interact with, well, SQL model. And those are typically the, the classes that you create that would be like SQL Alchemy or Django Orem models. But in your world, you can have inheritance. And then somewhere in that hierarchy, you set table equals true as you create the class. So it does. it's not necessarily that just, oh, you derive from this class, so that's a table. It gives you more flexibility and go, this part is a table, that part is a table. Like in the scenario we are talking about, you have a base uh, user where there's a name and a password, a hash password and stuff. No, sorry, <laughs> you wouldn't <laughs> want to put that. But you would, you would put like your shared stuff yeah, into like the base name, class. And then you, name, right, address, right, right. email, I don't know. And then the thing that derives from it, user would derive from like user base, which would say like table equals true, and it could have its secrets there. Exactly, exactly. Okay. You don't have to describe it better. So that makes a lot of sense inbound. What about outbound? So I've got a fast API endpoint, right? It could even be Flask or whatever, right? Uh, and I've done a query to the database and I get the table version that has the secrets. I can easily go to fast API and say the response model is the base thing. So the documentation is right. But if I go to the object that I got from the database and I say as dictionary or to dictionary, I forgot exactly what the right term is, but the thing that sends it back, it's going to include everything in it, isn't it? So the, the, and this is one of the, one of the, those particular details of fast API that I think people in many cases miss. And is that in fast API, you can, this, uh, you can say, Hey, this is the response model. So this is the model that I want you to use for the data that I'm sending back. The, the, the most obvious uh, result of that is that in the automatic documentation, you will get the schema of what is the response data. Uh, and that is like the most obvious and visible. But FastAPI will also use that same model to filter out the data. So if you say, okay, if you say the response uh, model is a user out, for example, and the class user out, which is a Pydantic class or something like that, this class user out doesn't include the hashed password from the function, you can return an object that includes the hash, pass hash password or a dictionary that includes the hash password. But FastAPI will omit that field. And FastAPI will only return the particular fields that were defined in the in the response model that you, that you say that will be returned. OK. I did not know that that also affected the outbound data, not just the documentation. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. And in fact, that's, that's uh, in many cases, people ask, why does FastAPI use this parameter response model instead of using the return type annotation. Because in Python, when you create a function, you can yes. uh, define what are the types of the parameters that the function receives. And you can also define what is the return of that particular function. 
if Fastly API use the return value, but then you and say like, hey, the return value is this user out, but then the, the object that you were returning from that particular function was a, a different object, then the editor will complain, the tooling uh, and the tools that detect those typing errors, like MyPy, will complain, and they will detect, hey, you're saying that you're returning something, but you're returning a completely different thing. So that's the reason why the return type is not what is used uh, to extract that information. And instead, it uses this particular uh, configuration response mode because yeah, it's so, used for filtering data too. Right. Okay. Interesting. So for people who don't know, haven't seen this in action, you put a decorator like an app dot or API dot get, for example, just like you would say in Flask or something. And you say, here's the URL, but then you also may put response model equals some pydantic type in fast API. And that drives the swagger documentation. And I am learning now drives the filtering of the allowed return values as well, which is pretty excellent. Yeah, in fact, it will also validate the data. So if you are saying, hey, this will return this data, and then whatever you're returning doesn't include that, uh, that will be that will actually be an error on the server because you are saying that the contract is that I will return this data, but then suddenly you are not returning it. Then it will raise an error inside of the server and it will tell you, hey, the data that you're sending is incorrect. So there's something going on here. There's something wrong with your code because you're sending something invalid from what you say that you are going to send. Oh, that's pretty fantastic. Okay. I didn't realize it made such great um, use of that response model. So that's just a whole nother level to bringing <laughs> Pydantic into that world. So there's a bunch of comments and thoughts here in the audience. So I kind of want to bring some of them in because there's a bunch of great ones. First of all, former guest Waylon says your mustache is fabulous, which is always <laughs> required when you're on a video. <laughs> Thank um, you very much. Uh, Sveta Link says big uh, like on Fast API. I, I think Fast API is absolutely uh, a great, great thing. <laughs> and Jacqueline also uh, very much. Um, Poplin says, I have a question. If the data schema is complex and has nested JSON structure, in what case would you validate it? Like, it's pretty straightforward to just nest the Pydantic. But this brings us, you know, if you're going to be in a world where you're nesting Pydantic things, you may want to save them to the database. What's the story on relationships and this basically, I, I've received some data that is like nested related data. What do I do in SQL model? So if you need to receive some uh, complex data structure and you need to extract the information, you can declare uh, you can declare models with Pydantic or with uh, SQL Alchemy, sorry, with SQL model saying that, hey, this is just a data model. And then you can manually extract the sub components and then just add them to the database independently or something like that. Uh, there wouldn't be a straightforward way to say like, hey, I received this giant JSON and automatically generate a bunch of different models that don't exist uh, yet or something like that. Uh, or to automatically infer where to put each, each information, it wouldn't be uh, as straightforward. Like it will have a different, a lot of different uh, design possibilities. So it will be easy to get it wrong. So the way that you will do it is that you define the complex data shape that you want to receive. And then once you take it, you just extract each, each part of the information uh, and each particular uh, object or each, each particular uh, uh, data point that you want to then save to the database. Now, to return data to the user, uh, with SQL model, you can have uh, relationships and relationships between different tables and have like automatic joins and all the stuff. This is all thanks again to SQL Alchemy, which is the right. thing that works underneath. It already models that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But then you can use that. Uh, you can use that that information, and you can just like declare the models. And this again works well with this idea of having inheritance to be able to declare, hey, I want to return this model, and I want it to include the particular this particular relationship model. So it will include the information from other tables, and it will just extract that information and return it to to the client. That's really cool. What about lazy loading? I'll ask this in two aspects. If I've got a relationship, I can do a join or a subquery load on it in SQL Alchemy so that if I know I'm going to be traversing that relationship, 
I don't end up with the dreaded n plus one performance problem where I thought I was doing one query and I'm doing 51 queries if I got a yeah. know, 51 uh, or 50 results back, something like that. Is that support flow through SQL model as well, the joins? Yeah, so the thing is that uh, SQL model actually just like exposes the same interface as SQL Alchemy because it's actually just using SQL Alchemy underneath. And SQL Alchemy supports everything, including like uh, lazy loading. SQL Alchemy actually supports things that are not supported by many other ORMs, like uh, uh, I forgot the name, uh, having primary keys that are composed of different, of several columns. Uh, composite like indexes composite, and, and yes. composite keys, yeah. Composite, term, composite keys, yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of things that SQL uh, Alchemy supports, and if SQL Alchemy supports them, then the uh, uh, SQL model automatically supports them because SQL model is just inheriting directly from SQL Alchemy. Yeah, that's really cool. Now, the question I was thinking about is, if I have a result from the database that has relationships, a relationship, and I return it from uh, a fast API endpoint, is that going to go and start iterating the relationship? Uh, you know, do do I need to be worried about n in, in plus one problems by returning these models that then are getting serialized in eager ways? You yeah, know, it's like so, tr tr tracing through all the relationships so it can build a whole JSON to get it back out. Yeah, and, and then and then return the whole database in a yes, single exactly. Like, JSON. Wow, that that took a while. That's that so would be why. so painful. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, by default. Uh, FastAPI and well, SQL model won't include uh, relationships in uh, in models, won't include them in the data that is uh, returned back. But if you need to include some of those, you can declare, again, using inheritance, you can declare a different model that uh, defines, hey, this relationship, this particular attribute, this should be included. Uh, and that way you can define that particular one in the specific endpoints that you want to include the information in the in the in the resulting value. Right, that okay. that will work to uh, force SQL model and to force uh, well fast API through SQL model to do all the n plus plus uh, plus one queries and to just extract the information and, and send it back. But you will, in, if you are returning that data, including the relationships, you will probably want to uh, uh, eagerly load that information, which is something that is supported by SQL model and uh, via SQL Alchemy. So you will yeah. load the information that you need, including the relationships, and then you just return that object directly and you define the model, hey, I want this to include the relationships. So it will just like include the information that is already there. I can see that this n plus one issue is without the join or eager load is happening through a profiler. If I was doing this in something like Django or Pyramid, I could look into the the debug toolbar and it'll actually show me the SQL al alchemy statements that are running. It'll be like, why are there 50 <laughs> queries on this page? <laughs> This harder, I suspect, in fast API, especially if it's operating in API mode where it doesn't have like debug toolbars and, and stuff like that. Um, probably yeah. one way you could see it is to say echo equals true on the engine. Is it yeah, exactly, exactly. Because fast API is, is not uh, because fast API is not integrated with any database, and, and SQL model just makes it super easy to work with fast API. But SQL model could be used with any other framework. And that, that was the intention. SQL model doesn't depend on FastAPI. FastAPI doesn't depend on SQL model. They just, they just integrate very well. But then you could just uh, enable the, the debug thing with SQL Alchemy that will then show all the particular SQL statements and show you, hey, this is what is running. This is what is happening. Right, yeah. So if you're connecting to the database, then this is a SQL Alchemy thing, but obviously it'll flow through, right? You just say... When you create the engine, you give it the connection string, you can say echo equals true. And if you are doing queries that are doing a bunch of indirect behind the scene, lazy queries for you, your your console window, your terminal, whatever, is just going to blow up with query. You're like, why is so much SQL screaming <laughs> yeah. by, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That, that, that's how it will work. Uh, let's talk about editor support really quick. So one of the things that's really nice about Pydantic is it requires you to state the types, whether those are fundamental types, whether those are nullable types like optional of int, or they're nested types like a 
uh, a user contains an address pydantic model, all of those scenarios result in really good editor support, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, what's the story for editors in SQL model? That's something you specifically call out about how that has yes. good support there. So if, if you check the source code for SQL model, it's actually super short. Uh, but it's just like a bunch of a lot of tricks together. And many of those tricks are actually about type annotations. Because the thing that allows your editor to provide you auto completion and the inline errors are the declarations of these types, the type annotations or type hints. And SQL model does a lot of internal work so that whenever you use any part of SQL model, you will get that type information in your editor. For example, if you query for query uh, some model, query some table to get information to get data from the database, the result that you get back, the object that you get back, will have internally all that type information, so that the editor will be able to provide you with all the active completion and all the inline errors and all those uh, things. SQL model, in fact, sacrifices some of the some of the more advanced or obscure or, or, or sophisticated use cases that SQL Alchemy supports, uh, and sacrifices those to instead get like very good auto completion and inline errors everywhere in in the code. Uh, and this uh, this is another thing that uh, uh, something included in SQL model is that it uses some uh, draft standards that are not even implemented yet. That are not even like I don't know are not part of the standards official standards yet, but they are already supported by some editors. For example, by Visual Studio Code already supports providing auto completion when you are creating a new instance of a particular uh, class or for the particular class of a model. Having this auto-completion is not very, very easy to do with other tools because the editor doesn't have any information about what is the what are the parameters that you can pass, what are the arguments that you can pass. Right. When you, you create pass. a pydentic model, it doesn't in anywhere indicate here is the constructor or initializer, and here are the keyword arguments that happen to be all the what look like yeah. static values, static yeah. fields. Yeah. It will just say like keyword arguments or like data star star <laughs> something like that yeah but i always think thanks for nothing when i see that <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but uh, actually pydantic 1.9 includes this same trick so now you get auto completion in visual studio code in pycharm you already have auto completion with pydantic because they have a, a, a plugin for pydantic to provide auto completion for those things but it requires this particular plugin now with this uh, extension, you can get also auto completion in VS Code, and with the same extension, without needing any plugin, you get auto completion for SQL model in Visual Studio Code. I think uh, the people from PyCharm were also uh, checking out to maybe support the same uh, the same standard, which will allow PyCharm to provide automatic auto completion for SQL model and other libraries like Pydantic and Atters and others. Sure. Yeah, that's great. Uh, definitely the widespread use of Pydantic effectively is, is forcing all, everyone to go like, all right, how can we make this work better on the <laughs> creation side? So uh, RJL, RJL out there has a, a comment, which then leads me to an interesting question. It says, I'm old fashioned. I use direct SQL statements, no ORM. I really need to take the time to go down this route. In indeed, I, I do think so. <laughs> um, it's, it's certainly yeah. worthwhile. Uh, um, I, maybe... What are your thoughts on, on using straight SQL versus not? Then I'll ask my question. So uh, uh, I, I think, you know, like it just is a lot about taste and how people prefer to code. Uh, th there's a lot of people that are so comfortable with SQL and that can do so many things with SQL very easily that it's just, it just more efficient to just use SQL direct. For me, uh, some of the advantages with uh, ORMs is that I get inline errors that I get out of completion for what is the name of the attribute. If I forget that I say secret underscore name, the editor will autocomplete that for me. Uh, but if I'm, if I'm typing that inside of just a long string in Python using SQL, then I have to remember because no one will tell me that I have a syntax error in my SQL or that I'm yeah. using an attribute that doesn't exist. You know, one of the things that actually blew my mind is PyCharm, if you set it up to... Uh, if you basically connect the database to your project, it'll give you autocomplete and error checking inside strings inside Python for That's your schema. Cool. 
which is amazing. That said, I never do that because <laughs> to me, one of the things that is super valuable, one is this autocomplete. The other is refactoring as well. Like, oh, did we change the name of that? Well, oh, there was that one query we didn't update and now it crashes in production, but only sometimes when it hits this case. And, you know, it's just the the way it sticks together and stays consistent to me seems a lot stronger if you're using yeah. models as well. Yeah, and absolutely. also the ability to swap backends, right? The, the way you do parameterized queries is different across different database backends. Yeah. Right. Also, um, if you write SQL by hand, then you have to be super careful and probably you have to be a SQL wizard and like know how to sanitize all the data that you're putting or like, you know, all the, otherwise you could end up in nasty situations. But saying, yeah, giving that, like, and saying that, there's a lot of people that prefer, really prefer writing SQL directly. You know, like the same author of Pydantic, which SQL model is based on, prefers to write SQL directly. The, uh, and like he's using FastAPI and everything, but it's just more comfortable to him. And uh, the author of Py, uh, PsychoPG, the driver for PostgreSQL, uh, he just uses SQL directly. It's just like more comfortable for him. Yeah. And he uses uh, FastAPI a lot, but still like it's just more comfortable. So I guess like it, it depends a lot on like the taste. For me, I depend a lot on the tooling and editor support and refactoring, as you were saying. like. If I change a name, I know that it's changed everywhere because I I won't remember. I won't remember where <laughs> did I made this mistake. So yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. So um, Martin in the audience asked an interesting question. Um, down here is a better example. One of the challenges of ORMs is to make set based operations apply back to the database. Like I want to uh, I want to change this field. Like I want to set a is on sale flag to true for all products where the, the price is less than $10, right? Where, where I'm not going to pull, I don't want to go, let me query all products whose price are less than $10, change it on the object and then push those changes. I want to push the, I just want to say update where this set that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Is, yeah. What's the story about that with SQL model? Cause so, that that's one of the things that can really just hammer productivity or, or speed, I guess, is if you've got to like pull back a whole bunch of stuff to just make sort of consistent changes across them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Like this is one of the use cases where you will want to interact directly with SQL alchemy and you can do that through SQL model, but you can uh, write like, where it's as complex as you want uh, through SQL model, but like just using pure SQL alchemy underneath. And like, you can use like very advanced uh, things with SQL right. alchemy. SQL model focuses a lot on like the, the simplest and most common use cases and providing like the best uh, developer experience and, you know, like certainty that the code is as error free as possible because you have all these type annotations and all these type checks. But for any case that is a little bit more advanced, you can just like drop di down directly to SQL Alchemy. And because SQL model is just pure SQL Alchemy, the models are themselves just SQL Alchemy. So you can just like use SQL Alchemy directly with it. In fact, you could use one of these models with a SQL Alchemy engine uh, directly and it will work. Interesting, okay. Sky points out on the audience that you were too humble to call out the PR that got that uh, autocomplete for VS Code was actually <laughs> for Bytendic, but was by you. So well done. Uh, way to <laughs> Thank keep you. moving it forward on both fronts. Um, let's see. So what about performance? Um, there's, there's extra goodness in the validation and the type conversions and stuff like that of, say, Pydantic, but is there a large overhead? for using this, say, over SQL Alchemy over, say, raw SQL? Yeah, well, so when you use, when you use, when you declare a model and you say, hey, this is a table model, so this is like the equivalent of a SQL Alchemy model, then a lot of the validation and, and that stuff with Pydantic is overridden. So when you create a model, it will not be validated on creation for that particular table because this will be handled directly by SQL Alchemy. And for example, with SQL Alchemy, you can create uh, uh, an instance of a model without setting all the attributes. And then you can set the attributes manually afterwards. If Pydantic was doing validation for that, like that will, that will explode and that will say, hey, this is invalid. Yeah. So when you are working with SQL Alchemy alone, 
uh, well, like with the SQL parts alone through SQL model, then it's just like using SQL Alchemy Direct. When you okay, are using, so it's not uh, really any different in terms of like whatever SQL Alchemy does, this does in terms of performance. Exactly, exactly. Okay, uh, got uh, it. it. It just it just has like uh, and, and actually the code is so so slim, it's so little that like whatever is the overhead will be. Uh, I will think it will be negligible. At the same right. time, I'm not optimizing for like squeezing the maximum performance, but for getting the maximum correctness in the code and the, the best developer experience. Because I feel uh, it helps a lot more to be a lot faster as a developer, building the tool and making sure that it's all correct than having the code super fast, but very difficult to debug and to understand and to, and to write correctly. So I guess you just got to decide, like, is an ORM the right fit at all? And if yeah. it is, then, then this is a, a pretty good choice if you like this API. Yeah, exactly. And like, yeah, absolutely. If, if you were needing like the maximum performance that you can get, you will probably end up just like getting an async, uh, <laughs> yeah. an async driver directly and just like writing SQL directly for the particular endpoint that needs this extra boost in performance. But for most of the other cases, this will probably help uh, making sure that the code is correct and making sure that you can write code quickly and like yeah. be done with the feature that you're implementing. <laughs> right on. All right, I've got one more thing I want to talk to you about. And then I've got, I, I did a Twitter, hey, I'm talking to Sebastian. Let's, what are the questions we should be asking? There, and I got a bunch of great ones on Twitter. So I do want to touch on those as well. Nice. One of the things though that you spoke about is um, the ability of having... I mean, this is just generally true true for SQL Alchemy. These models, they are tied back to a what's called a session or a unit of work to do with the database. And you can't like do a query, get a record, and then go from a separate situation and try to jam it back <laughs> into they, it's got to be stuck to the session that it comes from, right? So you don't share the models across sessions, but one of the things that would be nice is just to have a single one. And so Fast API has a dependency injection system that you talked about can be used for basically always providing one and only one session to uh, an API endpoint or a web endpoint that then could be the database management unit, like creating a unit of work that is the lifetime of the request, basically. You want to talk about that? Yeah, exactly. It, uh, I think you described it perfectly. I don't know what else can I add on top, but let's try. <laughs> so this dependency injection system is just like you declare some function and FastAPI will make sure to run that function and provide the value to all the things that are need that value uh, for one particular request. Right. And this this has nothing to do with the database, by the way. This could be anything. This could be a logging framework, whatever, right? Exactly. So this okay. this is this is uh, very useful for doing login, for doing authentication, for doing uh, authorization with roles and like whatnot, for doing logging, for setting up a, for setting up a, things that log stuff to remote servers like Sentry or like Datadog or I don't know for all those things that you need to do and that can be and that is a, that is some logic that needs to be shared and that could run before the request is handled and maybe after the request is done. And then you can share this information. So in, in many frameworks, there's a concept of a middleware, which is something that runs before the request and after the request. But then you have to run this thing for every request. With dependencies, with this dependency injection system, you can define exactly where you want it to run. And you can define, I want this to be run with a group of uh, endpoints or with a group of path operations, as I used to call them or for just one particular endpoint or for, or for a bunch of endpoints. Uh, and with this, uh, with, this, with this system, you can extract and you, you can generate whatever it is that you need to generate for the particular request. And the good thing about the dependency injection system is that if you are extracting information from the request, for example, uh, from a header, yeah. then this information will be also extracted and included with fast API, with all the open API and all these standards. So you will get that information in the automatically generated user interface to explore the API. Yeah, very cool. So what steps do I have to take to do dependency injection to get that session to show up? I remember you had it in the documentation, but I don't, I don't remember where it is right now. Yeah. So uh, um, I think for the particular case of for the particular case of SQL model, even though FastAPI and SQL model are are independent, 
are made to be very compatible with diary independent. I have a lot of documentation about writing uh, applications with FastAPI and SQL model in the SQL model docs. Uh, the way that you will, the way that we will do it, the way that you will handle a FastAPI dependency uh, in general is that from FastAPI, you import this special function depends, just start with that, and then you create some function that will return some value. This function will have the same style as any other function that handles a, a, a particular request. So it can have some parameters with some types, and those that information will be extracted from the request, and it just returns something. This is just a plain old function. And then you pass this, this function, is this is what will be the dependency. Then you pass that function as a parameter to depends, and then you put depends as the default value of some parameter in your main function that is handling the request. I see. So, so you could say session equals like depends. Here's some function that exactly. I'll call to create the session. Session equals depends and calling depends with the function that is named uh, get session or something like that. Do you have a way to see both sides of that uh, with dependency injection? So does it just return the value or can you like create a session and then yield the value and then keep processing or, or something along yes, those lines? Yes, exactly like that. Uh, you, okay. can, you can create a session that you can yield the value and then after the request is done, you can continue doing more stuff after yielding that particular session. So you can create a session, give the session uh, from the dependency, and then the main code that will handle the request will have that session. And then the same dependency can take care of closing the session after right. the request. Exactly. So Try yield exactly. the session, finally close it. Maybe like if there's no exception, commit it, something like that. Exactly. Okay. That's, so, pretty, that's pretty uh, flexible. Yeah, and in the main code that you have, then you don't have to take care about creating the session or closing it or making sure that there are no exceptions because you can do all that stuff in the dependency and share that logic uh, throughout your code. And the other all thing right. is that dependencies can themselves depend on, an, on all their dependencies. So you can create a dependency that gets the session for the database, and then you can use that in another dependency that gets the current user and extracts from the header or from the authentication token or whatever, extract the user ID, then gets the user ID from the database and then returns the, the current user. So that you have a whole dependency that just takes care of returning the current user, making sure that it's authenticated. And then in all your, uh, and you can reuse that code in all your in all your endpoints or in all the main functions that handle the requests. And all those functions will be able to just get the current user right away without having to uh, have all the logic to extract the information, process the token, all the stuff. Sure, this is very neat. Um, I haven't I haven't used this enough during my work with Fast API, so I got to check this out. All right, now let's do a bit of a lightning round here of the Twitter questions because I've seen some of these questions come up in the live chat, but I also <laughs> think I pulled out these ones that I thought people put on Twitter that were pretty good. So. Um, Lamat Webster says, any plans to ramp or replace Alembic to make migrations no more developer friendly? So first of all, migrations, you've got to keep your database in sync with your models. Otherwise, SQL Alchemy and hence SQL Model will freak out about that because um, it's, it's going to be a problem. But Alembic is, while it works, is a little bit hard to say like here's all the models you need to pay attention to and here's the scenario where you run it's it's a little bit clunky it works well but it's it's not super smooth and i think that's what matt's asking here yeah so alembic is a uh, alembic is the official tool from sql alchemy to do the migrations and because sql model it's itself also just sql alchemy underneath alembic works with it perfectly Alembic is a great tool. It's uh, super advanced and helps a lot. It can even generate automatic migrations and things like that. I think the main problem with Alembic is that in some cases it's not as intuitive. So yes, what I want to do at some point is to wrap a bit of Alembic. I wouldn't replace it because it's already doing a, a magnificent job, <laughs> but uh, and, and it will be super difficult to write all that logic and all that work that my very has been doing for a very long time with SQL model and Alembic. I will wrap it and I will try to add a bit more of documentation to explain how to handle the simplest cases, which is the same that I'm doing with SQL model. If you need something more complex, then you will probably just go to Alembic directly or to SQL Alchemy directly. 
Related to this, not Twitter question, Michael question. What about, do you have any thoughts about testing code using these models and stuff um, like fake data or, or mocking out the database beyond just the standard stuff you would do to SQL Alchemy? Like, is there anything special about SQL model that makes testing it easier or different than SQL Alchemy? No, the, the testing will be pretty similar to SQL pretty Alchemy. Similar. Yes, okay. uh, uh, I, I just have like a bunch of documentation of how to do testing and even how to do testing with FastAPI applications using SQL Alchemy and how to, for example, use a SQLite database for testing that could be run on memory instead of the production database that could be a PostgreSQL or My, MySQL right. or whatever. Just change the connection string to the engine and, and exactly. let it go. Yeah, okay. And then and then make it run with the, with the, in, with a database in memory and yep. then make it work correctly with threads. So and something like a like a, a pie test fixture that initializes the database, but you just use colon memory colon for the connection string so that it it just goes away. Yes, exactly like that. <laughs> it's documented exactly like that. <laughs> All right, right on. All right, uh, Ricky Lim says, would SQL model be part? Of, sh maybe should could be part of the standard Python library. I have some thoughts on this, but I want to hear your thoughts first. <laughs> I have some historical perspective on this, but I want to hear your thoughts on this first. OK, so uh, no, it, it will not be part of the standard library. Uh, ideally, it will not be part of the standard library, because if it was part of the standard library, it will mean that it will be available in Python 3.13 or something. And then <laughs> users of Python 3.10 right now will not be able to use it on one side. On the other side, having more stuff in the Python standard library adds more uh, inconvenience and more burden to the core maintainers, to the core developers of Python, which make, makes it even more difficult for them to continue supporting Python and all the different versions. Uh, and it will also complicate things for Red Canon that is trying to <laughs> figure out a way to slim down Python so that you can, for example, run it uh, directly on the web browser. How, how do we build it in WebAssembly? This doesn't help. Yes, WebAssembly. <laughs> and you know, Brett Cannon and, and Christian Haynes have been doing like a very cool job. It's very exciting. But a, a lot of that will probably require actually slimming down a bit the standard library, as far as yeah. I understand, but I'm not no expert. Yeah, I, I imagine a world where we have, I, I don't know what the right word for it is, but there's like a, a standard cross environment python minimum set of language features of standard library where things like you know stuff that talks on the network or does ui things or whatever just that is not part of this like minimum subset of python that we're guaranteed to have so that we can put it on web assembly we can put it on mobile devices we can put it on servers and as long as you program to this minimum set, your your place where your Python can exist is broader, you know, like MicroPython potentially. Yeah. Um, I think that that's the trend and not the trend towards putting more stuff there. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. And it, it's fun that it's already happening. MicroPython is already that. It's just that it, it cannot say it's a standard Python because it has to link down a bunch of things. Yeah. But being able to have a microcontroller and write code in Python that is that is running the microcontroller. That's amazing. That's my the most yeah. The most mind blowing thing for me is that you can hook a lambda lambda expression directly to a hardware interrupt. <laughs> like that, <laughs> that is like what you can do. What uh, that's amazing. The historical perspective that I wanted to bring up here is I believe the core developers actually considered this for requests and they decided that no, they're not going to put a request in the standard library to replace URL lib because it would limit requests ability to grow. Like changes could only come once a year. It couldn't come three times a week if there was important changes, right? Like the speed of development uh, would be hindered. So they said, you know what? No, we don't want that. Yeah. <clears throat> Yep. All right. Next, uh, Dimitri Figel says, are you considering working on generating TypeScript declaration files based on what's defined on the fast API backend? That was that documentation I showed where it has the schema and all that and like the endpoints. Yeah. So to, to, to make it, uh, to explain it a little more, when you go to the automatic interactive documentation for the API, that is all based on this standard uh, 
a schema of the API called uh, Open API. This is just a huge JSON that defines all the data shapes that you're using, all the endpoints, everything. But that same thing, because it's a standard, then you can use that same thing to generate code for clients that communicate with your, with your backend. And in fact, I, uh, there's a bunch of client generators for many languages, including TypeScript, and I have used them. I have used some of them, and they are actually very, very, uh, very good. Like you can, you can achieve things like defining in the backend what are the data shapes that you're using. Then you update something, and then you regenerate the client in the front end. And now after that, the front end team will be able to have access to this new API endpoint without a completion in their editor and everything. Uh, this is it works very well. It's super exciting. I just haven't had the the, the time to document like the whole the whole uh, recipe to make it uh, work. But it's already there. It's already working, and it already uh, it, it already does a great job. Yeah, maybe somebody wanted to contribute a PR or uh, do some help there. They could, right? Yeah, and you know, like uh, even, even a blog post will just like uh, that. That will be a lot faster to get out, and that will yeah. help a lot and a lot of people. Indeed. Zach Code says, I'd love to hear uh, how you approach figuring out the integration with SQL Alchemy. I mean, we talked a bit about this, but yeah. It, any other lessons you've learned from basically getting in the middle of SQL Alchemy and all of that it does? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting that SQL Alchemy was created at a time where like it was, I don't, I don't know, Python 2 point something. There were no context managers. So that thing that you do uh, in a, with a blog that you say, with uh, something, something as blah, blah, blah. And then inside of that, you put code. That was not available in Python. That didn't exist. Yeah. SQL Alchemy was made before that. So SQL Alchemy had to do a lot of uh, sophisticated tricks to make everything work. And then getting down <laughs> inside of it and trying to understand all that. And it's like, why is this thing doing this and working like this? And it's because of those, of those things. Uh, I think I ended up like learning a lot about those little details and a lot about how classes work internally and how a class is an instance of what and all those things and how you can configure all that. Uh, but but the idea with SQL, with SQL model is to make it super easy for you to use it without having to deal, deal with all the internal complexity. Yeah, you, you don't have to know. Only you had to know and, and go through yeah, it. It's so I think it's worth pointing out, I did have Mike Bayer on the show recently to talk about SQL Alchemy 2.0 and how they're moving to have basically the client side view of that be everything as a context manager and sort of uh, change that up a bit. So. How is this? How close is this to the 2.0 model, or is it the 1.0 model API? Yeah, so or... uh, uh, Mike Bayer did a lot of work to make the compatibility transition as easy as possible. And SQL Alchemy, the latest available version, which is 1.4, it's compatible with the previous style and with the new style. So code that is written with the new style will be compatible with SQL Alchemy 2. Point whatever and above. SQL model is based on this new style. So uh, if you, if you, for example, if you have an old application with SQL Alchemy, the first thing that you will want to do is to mi migrate to SQL Alchemy 1.4 and make sure that it's compatible with the new style and uh, uh, make sure that you don't have any warnings. That's the main thing that you will do to make sure that it's compatible. And then after that, you can migrate to, to SQL model. The migration is also super simple. It's just like changing some classes for type annotations, but yeah. Yeah. A absolutely. There was a question. Yeah. So the, the question by Python at night was, what would the level of effort or benefit, if any, of converting SQL alchemy models and schemas to SQL model? Sounds like the effort is small and the benefit is all the features we spoke about, right? Yeah. Check. Yeah. Okay. Would you recommend it? I mean, people are using well, SQL like, Alchemy, they're like, you know, I'd really would like to have some of that pedantic magic. Like, when would you say, okay, the the trouble of making a change is sufficient? So uh, right now, benefit is sufficient. yeah, like, so if I if it was me, I would just use it right away. Uh, <laughs> right now, it's in version 0, 0. 0.0 point something. I will release 0. 0.1.0 once I have 100% uh, of test coverage. Right now is 97%, just because I'm a freak about that. Uh, but like, 
most of it should already work. It's actually very simple. And if anything, the, like the, the, the work that it does is actually very small because underneath it's all done by Pedantic and SQL Alchemy. If anything went wrong, you could also just like switch back to SQL Alchemy directly. It's just that-, right. that Basically change your class benefits. back to uh, driving from SQL Alchemy base yeah. and you're, you're good to go. Yeah. Okay. The benefit that you will get is auto-completion and inline errors everywhere where you are using these classes that you will normally not get. And, and the integration with um, and response the integration, model. Yes, of course, uh, integration right. with response yeah. models. And yeah, actually, that's a lot of code that you will save if you can share that with Pydantic and with SQL Mode. Just yeah. make sure that you follow all the information about how to pin and how to upgrade versions because uh, it's very mm -hmm. detailed how you, should, how, how you should go about that because... As, as things are still changing and as, as uh, it still has like a little bit of extra testing to do, uh, you, should be, you should be careful about how to ping. Just not uh, install like whatever version comes, just make sure that you pin the right version, you have tests, and then when you upgrade, you make sure that the tests are pausing and then like you can uh, upgrade the version. Yeah, good advice. Uh, already talked about that one. So Lado asks, um, are you going to stretch modern Python conventions from the back end part, which you already did? We talked about like um, using the types and stuff for uh, model binding to Python challenging front end as well. Should we expect something like ReactiPy, <laughs> like <laughs> React, but in Python? That, that uh, do, you, do, you, do anything, do you care about the front end in the sense that you have any intention to build stuff for it? Yes, I, I care about the front end, and I have I have actually I think I started in that, and I have worked with Angular, React, Vue.js, and like all the stuff. Uh, I uh, I think it will be amazing to be able to write Python in to write Python for front end. But if someone is gonna make that happen at some point, we're probably Brett Kanner and Christian Haynes uh, making WebAssembly work for yes. Python. Yeah, you need the runtime there first, and then it'll go much more easily. I, I absolutely think that it is, it's not quite negligence, but it's close that the browser makers don't package other runtimes that are yeah. WebAssembly compatible, right? Like they should go to Ruby, they should go to Java, they should go to .NET, and they should go to Python and say, are you willing to provide us a runtime that does X, Y, and Z that we can integrate in a generic way? that we can include in our browser. So you don't have to say, oh, well, you can't use these other advanced things because the WebAssembly download is 10 megs. Well, if Firefox, Chrome, and Safari all shipped, you know, five of those, the five most common languages as binaries, like you would just have it. And it would just yeah, be this WebAssembly. So why, why does this not happen? So, <laughs> but that's the real problem to Reactify is that that's, uh, that's not there, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, Quasi says, what is he doing to address the bus factor? That is, if you get hit by a bus and then related to that in the audience, Prashat Rana says, well, you include a moderator to the project uh, so it can become a community driven project and there's less burden uh, on you. Like, I think those are kind of similar questions from a different perspective. Yeah, so the thing is, uh, for most of these projects, like most of the work can already be done a lot by the community. It's not that it's not that the work is cannot be done. Uh, I just want uh, simply enable a bunch of permissions to a lot of people to just go and merge pull requests uh, that uh, very quickly because I like to make sure that everything works. For example, yesterday for yesterday's fast API release. It had like four approvals, the pull request, but still it had a couple of bugs and a couple of things that need, needed to be solved. Uh, and like, I need to be able, I need to make sure that the code quality is still kept and that everything is working correctly. So for now, I'm still like uh, making sure that I review each one of the pull requests. But if people went and checked those pull requests and reviewed the code and uh, tested it and like made sure, hey, this is working and I'm using it, uh, and it's working in my application or things like that, that will, of course, help a lot. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. of course, that will, that, will, that will help a lot. That's great. I, I mean, obviously, it's open source. People can fork it. 
they can they can run with it. Like, yeah, and if you actually them. got hit by a bus, I think fast API would keep going. There'd just be a figuring out of like, all right, well, where's it going to center back around before it settles down? Yeah, not exactly. that anyone wants that. I think obviously this these questions are a reflection of how significant the impact you're having on the community is, right? Yeah, and you know, like it's I, I find the boss factor fun. I have been I have been uh, wanting to write a blog post about that for a while because I think the boss factor is something that uh, works a lot for investors that uh, or for like founders that are not developers and they are like associating with someone that is the only one that knows the product, but they want to be the owners of half of it. And if this person dies, they just lose all their investment. <laughs> But when right. you're working they with can't keep it going projects, yeah absolutely yeah like you know like uh, uh, for example many of the projects from encode is mainly tom christie which is one person mm -hmm. the maintainer of flask which is huge is mainly david lord and he's just like suffering through all of this and through all the uh, abuse from open source developers and doing like a lot of the work uh, and probably like i don't know i think he has like another contributor or something like that in the case of fast api there's people like uh, marcelo that is helping a lot and even Samuel Colvin is also helping uh, that, that, you know, helps a lot with, with keeping the community, maintaining it and like doing all the work that is needed to be done underneath. Uh, but that, that doesn't, doesn't really, uh, that doesn't really affect how, 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 it's, how it's working, you know? Like the fact that the repository is not in another, in another GitHub, uh, owner in a GitHub organization or something like that. It's just because it's easier to handle. But at the, at the same time, there's a lot of people that are already contributing, and like that's yeah. that's the work that actually makes. Uh, that, that's the stuff that matters. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Alupia, just by the way, out there also says, just want to say thanks to you. So uh, your work is so important and just great. So yeah, uh, definitely a lot of people are loving it. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Back to um, SQL model roadmap for the future. What are the plans? So uh, migrations. I want to have a, a small wrapper to have a command line interface built on top of Typer so that you can get auto completion in the terminal as well. Uh, to have migrations based on Alembic. To uh, documentation for using async with SQL mode. Async is already supported by SQL Alchemy. Yeah, and that's a new thing, right? That is, um, you've got to create now an async client uh, or an async session, rather. So I think it is instead of a regular session in SQL Alchemy. But that's one of the 2.0 big changes that Mike just yeah. pushed out. So you, that flows through for you? Yeah, yeah. Like you can already use it. In fact, there's people using it in applications, in production applications right now. <laughs> uh, but it's just that I don't have it documented yet. SQL Alchemy, SQL Alchemy already supports both the normal, the, the blocking interface with the regular interface and the async interface. And you can already use it with SQL mode as well. I want to document all that uh, too. Right. So what you should do is you should just change your dependency injection based on whether you have a def method or an async def method in fast API and either exactly. create an async client or async session rather, or regular session, and then boom, off you exactly. go, right? And that is one of the things that I think is so smart about the design of SQL Alchemy, that SQL model inherits, is that the thing that handles if it's async or not is the engine, not the models themselves. Mm. Uh, yes. So you can use the same models, even if it's async or not. Yeah, I, I agree. Very nice. Um, good question by Lars, but I'm going to keep going because we're short. Uh, David Smith asked, is there plans to add async? I yes. think the question is, are there plans to document async? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At this point, right? Hey. Um, we kind of touched on this one about whether you should use it for uh, an existing, like, should you be migrating? We touched on that one. Uh, I think uh, Brandon Brainer, who I think I saw on the audience, yeah, earlier. Hey, Brandon, ask, could you go ahead and make no SQL model? This is a chance for me to mention uh, Beanie out there. Uh, I wanted to kind of ask you if you'd had a chance to look at this. Where? What's my best link for this? Um, there it is. So Roman Wright also was out in the audience. I saw them. Him. Uh, so Beanie is a ODM like for MongoDB, but also basically very similar based on on Pydantic. And so I thought it was a. This immediately came to mind when I thought about 
sequel model is like, well, here's the MongoDB version that also yeah. you know tries to do the same thing. Have you thought about a NoSQL story? Have you looked at Beanie? What are your thoughts here? Yeah, like I, I really like uh, both. That there are two alternatives for a uh, MongoDB with Pydantic. Uh, one is Beanie, the other one is Odemantic. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they are both doing a great job. I, I like uh, this particular thing about Odemantic is that it uses the same style of the interface of SQL Alchemy, that the thing that decides if it's async or not is the engine and not the model, which means that it will probably be easier to implement uh, because both Bini and Odemantic both are async. Uh, yeah. But having the engine being the one that is async or not will allow implementing a regular or blocking version of it uh, so that you could have MongoDB models that are shared and reused for async code and for blocking code in the same application. So you could migrate more slowly or things like that. But yeah, I think both, a... both are doing a great job and like uh, have a very nice interface that is like very close to Pydantic. Yeah, just as a sidebar, I do wish it was easier in Python to convert an async call to a synchronous call, knowing that it would block. Just go like, okay, here's here's a async method. If I could just go dot wait or dot <laughs> dot result or something, and just make it execute and basically stop the async running from there, then then you could just do the query like dot. <laughs> That give yeah. me the answer, right? You know, Whereas like, it's it's a little more tricky. You've got to get it like in the loop and run the loop to completion and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, but you know, like that's why I just built uh, asynker, which is built on top of any IO. And the idea is that you have a uh, this uh, this function asyncify and the function syncify just to do that. So you can pass uh, you can pass one uh, function that is async and it will be run inside of the main event loop. Uh, in uh, async way, or you can say, hey, asyncify this thing, and it will run the blocking function in a thread pool so that it's not blocking the main event loop and like all the stuff. But it's actually, the, the, the work is actually all done by any IO. It's again, yeah. just doing the, thing, the same thing of getting <laughs> type annotations and auto completion and all the stuff on top of oh, the thing cool. that is actually doing the work. Yeah, I, I definitely came across this not long ago, and it looks very exciting. And I wanted to talk to you about it, but as you can see, we're way over time already yeah, for yeah, just yeah. our main thing. So let's go back to it. But you know, maybe cool. next time you're on, we could just talk about async stuff awesome. all day. Uh, Mike out there asks, what is the risk of using it in production? The risk is the risk that you use you have for using any software in production. Uh, Let this... me maybe rephrase it. Like, So what is the readiness for production, I guess, is the probably what he was thinking. Yeah, so the thing is, uh, most of the work is done by Pyrantic and SQL Alchemy, and they have been used for years, and they are doing um, an amazing job, hmm. and they are already used by a lot of tools. Uh, SQL Mall only does like a little bit of extra stuff on top, just so that you can get all the type annotations. Most of the work is done by those. Uh, the other thing is that the uh, test coverage is at ninety-seven percent, so you have some certainty that it's working as intended, at least. I want to have it at one hundred percent, and I want to have uh, tests in continuous integration with several databases because right now the tests are only run in SQLite. But you know that all the SQL stuff is actually done by SQL Alchemy, which is already tested in all the databases. So yeah. you know, like there's there's the this uh, this this trade-off. Or trying this thing that that still has a little bit of extra stuff to do, but most of the most of the extra things that I will do on top of SQL model are actually documentation, not that much yeah. whole changes. And the ability to flip from one to the other pretty quickly means if you had to say, oh no, this yeah. is not working out, we're switching back. It's not like, oh well, <laughs> you're completely rewriting it, right? It's yeah. not that much work. You just have to make sure that you pin the versions and you upgrade correctly, but otherwise it should it should work. And you will get more certainty about the code correctness because you have all the type uh, help. So yeah. Yep. All right, we got one question left. Do you have this ability to take what are often somewhat existing APIs and then improve them in ways that people really connect with, right? Like fast API didn't start from open TCP socket and let's start from there. It started on top of Starlet, right? Like you already mentioned, Tom Christie. Uh, this is on top of, of two very important libraries that, you know, they should go together, uh, but didn't. 
so the question Pierre asks is, you know, how did you learn to sort of come up with APIs like you you have? Like, what's your what's your recipe for building this? <laughs> I think I think the, the the thing is that I have been always trying to solve a problem, and I have always trying to uh, improve my own developer experience and to improve the way that things work for me. And like I have ended up just like trying to understand what is the best way to achieve those things. And at some point, I ended up learning a little a little bit about type annotations, uh, and I realized that hey, this can be super powerful. I can reuse it for different things. And after looking and looking for different frameworks that did what I wanted, uh, I ended up like saying like, okay, I just have to build this because it doesn't exist yet. Uh, but it was just like trying to achieve getting the thing that, that, that I want. For example, I wouldn't go and build a NoSQL model for MongoDB because there's already been an Automatic. They are already solving the, the problem. Uh, I try to avoid building new things, uh, but when, when there's the case that nothing is really solving the thing that I want to, to have, then like I go and try and try to do it. The other thing is, I think one of the main uh, features about these tools is just the good documentation. Uh, and I guess like the, the only thing about that is that I write it as I would have liked to learn those things when, when I was just starting and was struggling to understand what are, where all these things. And I always have in mind, like how would a newbie learn this thing and, and understand it. Uh, I guess that's probably the, the, the main thing that I'm trying to, to make it as easy to use uh, as possible. Yeah. I, I feel there's a strong blend of like, let's take the new things that are really useful that maybe not everyone's using and make them very accessible, make them very easy and, and default and so on. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the value spirit, I think. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, that's all the questions. We've been going a little bit long, but I, I really <laughs> I appreciate the time. Let's just real quickly uh, ask you the final two questions. I'll let you get out of here. All right. Awesome. So if you're going to write some Python code, work on SQL model or something else, what editor do you use these days? Uh, I think the both main editors, Visual Studio Code and PyCharm, are doing an amazing job at supporting all these tools. Right now, my 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 main one is Visual Studio Code, but yeah, like, I will I will choose yeah, uh, right one on. of those. Okay, very good, very good. And then notable PyPI packages. I feel like we touched on these a little bit, but yeah, we we just mentioned them. Automatic and Bini for doing the same SQL mode stuff, but for MongoDB. Yeah, right on. Uh, I agree; those are both great. All right, Sebastian, it was great to have you back, and congratulations on SQL Model. Maybe next time we'll talk async. What do you think? Awesome. Sounds great. Thank you very much, Michael, for inviting me. Thank you, everyone, for staying this long.